Good evening. Greetings, everybody, and happy holidays. Welcome to our panel discussion, So You Want to Start a Business. This panel discussion has been put together to benefit our entrepreneurial ecosystem and aspiring entrepreneurs, wherever you may be, who have tuned in to hear from three professionals, three entrepreneurs, three leaders in their fields who have come to share their experience, to share their challenges, to share their successes with the intent to make an impact on our ecosystem and to help the entrepreneurs who are viewing tonight. I am Dr. Patrick J. Murphy, Goodrich Endowed Chair, Professor and Director of the Entrepreneurship Program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. It's a real honor for me to serve as the moderator tonight for our panel discussion. I'm very excited about these three particular entrepreneurs, and I think you guys are in store for a really valuable discussion. I'm going to introduce them in just a second, but I just want to give you a preview of uh, what to expect in our agenda. We're going to have a discussion for about one hour. I will uh, moderate the discussion. I will pose questions to the panelists. I invite you to listen, to think, to make a note if you have a question, because at the end, there will be time for Q&A with the audience. And so without further ado, I'm going to name our panelists right now. First, we have Crystal Bryant, owner and chef at K&J's Elegant Pastries. Next, we have Thomas Walker Jr., co-founder and CEO of Swervis. And third, we have Funny Maine, CEO of Maine Attractions, M&P, comedian and actor and a former radio host. Thank you, all of you, for serving on this panel tonight. And I just mentioned your names, but before we get into the, the questions about entrepreneurship, I would invite each of you to take 30 seconds or so and just tell the audience why you think you became an entrepreneur. What was it about something in your past when you were coming up or maybe something in your personality or both and then share just a little bit more about your business because I didn't say much about it, but only take about 30 seconds or a minute. And we'll start with Miss Crystal Bryant. Um, go ahead, Crystal. Okay, I am Crystal Bryant. I'm the owner, chef, and creator of KJ's Elegant Pastries. My business is a full bakery where we service for weddings, we do cupcakes, ice cream, milkshakes, you name it. Um, my why for becoming an entrepreneur is because I wanted to pursue my passion as a creative. I'm big into art, drawing, painting, all of that, and I love food, so I kind of combined those two things and became a culinary artist. <laughs> and I'm not big on sweets. <laughs> Thomas, are you there? Here. What's up, everybody? My name is Thomas Walker. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Swervis. Yeah, so Swervis, we provide um, a pickup and drop off, a contactless pickup and drop off of your vehicle's maintenance. We partner up with auto repair facilities uh, where you get your oil change, you get tires, even where you uh, may have uh, the need to get a, a body work done as well. So. Um, I've grown up in the automotive industry. My family, we have three independently owned Goodyear locations around town. So um, I've done everything from change tires, change oil, um, you name it. Um, so that's that's my bread and butter and my why. Um, I've always loved um, solving problems. Um, even back in the day, I used to grab my brother and we used to take popsicles out of the freezer and go sell them in the neighborhood. So I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit, um, great communicator, and I love experiences. So when I brought the idea to my partner, Warren, um, and we began to execute Swervis, it was just natural for us. So appreciate it from being here. Funny man, you're up. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Uh, comedian Funny Man. I've been a comedian 
uh, for 15 years now. I really love what I do. I had a chance to uh, perform with a lot of my uh, favorite comedians. I turned uh, that comedy into uh, that love of comedy. Also, having a lifetime love of football, I turned that into content. And we turn that content into a business. I'm actually in the warehouse now where we sell and move all of the shirts and the merchandise and everything. Uh, of course, we do uh, comedy tours and it's just been uh, great to get out and meet people, to talk some football, to talk about the South, uh, have some fun with it, uh, do a lot for the community, uh, just spread smiles to everybody. And uh, why I became an entrepreneur, it was it was the thing to do. It's nothing like working for yourself and also having the ability to uh, employ other hardworking people. I really love my employees. I love my staff. Uh, they do a great job uh, just helping me be the best that I could be. All three of you and to the audience, I hope you are very excited to hear from these three tonight because the goal of our program is to convey information to anybody listening about what to do, how to do it. If you have an entrepreneurial idea and you wanna turn it into a business and make impact or make money um, to serve yourself or to serve others, this is what we're gonna talk about. So we're gonna have a very practical, authentic discussion and we're gonna dig a little bit deeper with these three panelists. The first thing, that I would like to ask our panel is, we've heard you each talk individually about why you became an entrepreneur and what you do, but we would like to hear you dig a little bit deeper and talk about who else is with you. And for this question, I'm talking about your entrepreneurial team. I would like to ask any one of you who would like to tackle this question, what should one's entrepreneurial team look like? How and when, especially when, when should you start building a team? At what stage of your entrepreneurial venture? And then tell us your own personal views about how important it is to build the right team. Who'd like to go first? I can start out that question, Dr. Murphy. Um, so I know everybody's different, but for me, um, building a team for me was important to have people that I trust more than anything um, people that I love. So my team consists most of family and I've got three employees that are friends, but they are family as well. Um, and it took a while for me to get there. Of course, I started my business as a one single person business um, until my business was able to grow. And I felt like it was the right time for me to hire one person. Um, so I don't think you should build a team up without having uh, the business to support that team, because if you hire a ton of people and you're not very busy, uh, you can't support them. So I started very small. It's just me. I hired one person full time, hired my sister um, as a part time worker. And uh, over the years, my sister became my lead. Um, she is what I call my GM <laughs> of KNJs. She is the person that I trust 100 percent. Um, and you know, just like you said, growing that, growing that business, when you grow that business and you can start to add to your team, um, you definitely want people that you can trust and people that are going to be on time and people that are going to be as passionate as you are, um, because you have to be able to trust them with your business. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely I would say trust would be my main focus when I'm hiring somebody or if I'm adding someone to my team. And so just a real quick follow up before we move to the two gentlemen, how do you, how do you, you, you mentioned family. So these are people, you know, but imagine it's not family. How do you build trust? How do you find trust? Well, um, most of the people that work for me are actually interns, people who I had sought out through. One of them came from a school, a culinary school here locally. One walked in and asked to intern under me. And that's been six, seven years ago. Um, so doing that, I, I was able to see their work ethics. Could they be able to handle the job? You know, it's almost like a test run with them. And um, that allowed me to see what they can do. And then I hired both of them on full time. And one has been with me 
like I said, for seven years, that other one has been with me for four years. So I think hiring somebody like part time or finding an intern or something like that, you know, where you can get them to kind of get their feet wet and they are working with you for a little while. Uh, and then that way you can see their work ethics and see, uh, OK, I want to pursue this person as a full time employee or as a part time employee. That is excellent. Gentlemen, would one of you like to answer that question? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I was uh, I was blessed uh, to have my manager approach me when uh, we were at the University of Alabama. I was a graduate student. He was an undergrad student. That was 10 years ago, 2010. So he had a vision um, or saw my talent and he had a vision for himself that he wanted to manage talent. So uh, we connected and we've stayed in touch for 10 years. So having someone that has grown with you through the ups and downs before you had a following before you had any cash flow or anything it means a lot and i know that's not everybody's case but uh i think that's why people usually lean on family because that's someone that you have a personal relationship with but i would encourage people as you're building your team teach people how you want your business to be a lot of people don't you know every corporation has like training uh, courses for a few months. Uh, churches have new member courses. So people are training you how to be in their space. So uh, write up a small handbook, write your goals for people so they don't just come in and try to figure everything out. Uh, and then they're not on the same page with you. But I think training people to operate in your business is definitely the way to build a team. Excellent. Thomas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one word that I wanted to Pick out of that what Jermaine um, kind of painted the picture of is having a vision of your business. Um, and as you go and you try and find people who are going to be a part of your business and share your vision with them. Um, and the ones that are very excited, the ones that are um, ready to rock with you, um, those are ones that I would I would recommend to pour some some energy into. Um, my co-founder is my best friend. Um, that's, <laughs> that's him standing next to me. Um, and we've known each other since we were 10 years old. So like Crystal said, there was trust from the get-go. Um, we've known each other for a very long time, but as we've grown um, older and matured, um, we've become even closer. Um, and when you start talking about business and things like that, um, it's very important to have that foundation um, and to always go back to um, each other's corner and making sure that, hey, we have our friendship, right? Uh, but we also know when uh, business needs to come at the forefront too. So uh, one reason why I even uh, came to Warren about it was because he's my, uh, <laughs> my better half. Um, um, I try to cloak myself with people that are uh, smarter than me, uh, more intelligent and, uh, and that sort. So that have different skill sets than myself. So um, as you begin to build your your business model and create that vision, uh, you will find what you are lacking. Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it technology? Um, and you start to fill in those gaps with people that uh, believe in your vision and that you uh, want to work with for the long haul because your your, biz your business that you're starting, that's your baby. So you want to be able to trust them with um, wanting to pursue that with you. And so we heard Crystal talk about trust, everybody. We heard Funny Main talk about growth and growing together. And we heard Thomas talk about communicating vision as a way to connect with people who might join your team. Trust, growing together, and a vision. Three very essential elements to building a team. It leads us to our next question that I want to uh, put to the panel. And this one involves networking. So when you're gonna build a team, or you're going to connect with people who can help you, whoever they may be, networking is important. And everybody has different philosophies of networking. They have different definitions of networking. But for successful entrepreneurs like yourself, what the audience really wants to learn from you is, how can I start and how can I network in a way that it will help me grow my business? And as you talk about your general theory of networking, I would invite you to please uh, share your personal strategy, anything you found that works really well, that's practical, that somebody listening could do tomorrow if they wanted to. 
But let's just open the discussion up to networking right now. And anybody who'd like to grab that question, go ahead. I want to grab. <laughs> I'll jump in there. I'm going to start calling on you individually. Yeah. yeah. I, think, uh, I think a good way to network is uh, hashtag searching. Uh, going on. Some of you may have caught uh, this program tonight from hashtag search. I made sure on Instagram to put at least uh, five or six hashtags. But if you uh, go type in like entrepreneurship or marketing or branding, uh, you'll find that you, you know, you can run into some different events locally. You can run into some great memes and information from different pages that you could follow. But uh, social media is definitely a great uh, way to do that, like following just pages who pump out information every day. And, you know, so I would say social media would be a good way to yes. start your networking. Yes. Yeah, there's there's different there's different avenues of social media. Right. Um, for for instance, uh, how I started networking and getting in different groups and that sort. There's one program in particular called Meetup. Um, and when I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina, that was the first time that um, I went in, um, was uh, able to network and venture with people that were in technology that wanted to learn more about technology. Um, so Meetup was a, a great tool um, that I first started off with. And we have some of those here in Birmingham uh, where um, we meet up at different restaurants, different bars and that sort. Uh, but networking is very key, uh, not only for our business, but for others as well, because at these different events so you find under entrepreneurs and you find out um, what best practices are. It's kind of like in th this type of event that we're having right now, um, how you can learn and experiment. Um, and generally, entrepreneurs naturally want to help out each other. Um, as we've grown our business, uh, some of the the best people that have been around me. Um, I've met at different organizations, different uh, companies that have shared our service with their fellow co-workers and been champions for us. So um, if you're in different industries, you know, entrepreneurs, we're like a fraternity and we all want, want each other to win, you know? So um, there's many different, you know, uh, organizations and events at Innovation Depot, um, UAB does a, a, a networking um, on Wednesdays. Hope that we can get back on that, Dr. Murphy, uh, you know, very soon. So um, networking is very key uh, to harnessing and getting some skills up under your belt so that you can um, keep moving your business forward. So Thomas, let me ask you, um, you talked about meetup.com and mm -hmm. Main talked about social media and technology. But right. You started to get a little bit. You took it into real life because you're talking yeah. about talking to other entrepreneurs. So right. I want to ask you, how do you talk to somebody you never met before? How do you approach them? How do you go up to them? Is it uncomfortable? And if so, how do you deal with it? What kind of things do you say? Because I'm sure you've done a lot of that. But if you could tell the audience how you think about cold calling strangers or just walking up to them. Right, right. Yeah, it is a little scary. It is awkward at first, uh, but uh, when you get your your feet wet, it, it's one of those things where you just do it. Um, I I can recall sometimes where um, I've gone to certain events and it feels like everybody knows each other, but I'm the one that doesn't know anybody in the room, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, it takes a little bit of courage and going up to people and and talking to them and first listening to them um when, when you start to listen to people and what they talk about what they're doing some of the challenges that they're having uh you start to feel more comfortable with what you can talk about too um mm -hmm. so when you do go to certain networking events and that sort and someone is talking about hey um we just had a big win with a customer and that sort. And then you start asking them, hey, well, how did you get to that point with, with that customer and that sort? So um, it's certain things like that that you can pursue. Um, and like I said before, it is a little daunting at first, uh, but uh, once you start getting your feet wet with talking with strangers and that sort, um, networking at pitch competitions and uh, different events where people are on the same page as you um it it, it helps out with that 
um, greatly. That's right. All right. That is excellent. Crystal, please share why networking matters to entrepreneurs in your view. And if you have any strategies that have worked for you as you've built your business, please share them with the audience. Uh, absolutely. So like Thomas and Funny Man said, um, you know, just networking with people who are like minded. So like when I was up and coming and wanting to open my bakery, I didn't know a whole lot of entrepreneurs. I didn't have anybody I could ask a question to or, you know, uh, how do I do this or how do I do that? So as I have become an entrepreneur, I make sure that if I know someone else who's doing very well or who's super successful, I'll, um, you know, introduce myself to them. Or if they're opening a new restaurant, I'm going to drop by, meet them, you know, so my, for me and in my industry, I just try to network with the people who are in this industry um, because they have, most of them have gone through things that I may not have gone through yet. So I can always mm -hmm. rely on them. And um, recently I was inducted as a Dane, uh, which is a huge, like huge international group of ladies who uh, are in the hospitality industry. And it's like the big names, you know, like Kathy G and Betty Satterfield and all the people who have been doing this for years and years and years. And uh, just to be inducted into that group, uh, when I get in the room with them, we can bounce so many ideas off of each other. You know, even though someone may be a, you know, food stylist or they're a recipe developer or they own a bar or they own a restaurant, we can all relate in some type of way. Uh, so definitely, like Thomas said, you know, make sure you're joining a group. Make sure you're in the room with people who are like minded so you can ask them those questions that you may have been asking yourself, you know. And we were talking about just now in the early days when you guys are coming up and networking and connecting with people who can help you. Mm -hmm. But let's flip that around for a minute. And uh, what about now? Because all three of you have achieved a level of success. And I'm sure people who are starting out come to you. So how, yeah. do you how do you respond to that? How do you uh, how do you treat that? Is it a responsibility for you to do that to help the community or are you too busy or? What are your thoughts about making time to network with others who are coming to you? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of what tonight is about, Dr. Yes. Murphy. Um, you nice. know, we this isn't our first time, uh, mm -hmm. maybe as a group, but this isn't our first time as individuals, you know, trying to put information out, uh, extending the olive branch to um, other business people and entrepreneurs. So, uh, it's it's always ongoing. Uh, I think depending on how the heart is set up, and I know these people in the chat very well. You know, we love to give to others because yeah. once we got some level of success, we were like, "Hey, y'all, it could be done." Yeah. So, <laughs> that's what tonight is about. Absolutely, that is inspiring, and everyone in the audience heard that. You can reach out to these three entrepreneurs yes. for help with your business and they will make time for you and it's very important in a community in an ecosystem for all entrepreneurs to do that yes and i think that's an important point anything else about networking before we move on because that's a very important topic and i just want to make sure we treat it uh thoroughly right uh we may not have anything but if the audience members uh later in the show we will be taking audience questions so kind of write it down make a mental note so for the q a if y'all got any questions out there uh, about networking we'd love to answer them. that's right that's right we're gonna i'm sure we're gonna have a great q a later and so to the audience you heard these panelists just talk about the use of technology yes. you heard them talk about standing strong and just behaving and approaching and doing what you need to do to connect with people you don't know, even though it's uncomfortable. You may be concerned about what they might think of you, but it's a discipline, right? Train yourself not to be concerned about what they might think of you and go and introduce yourself, ask them questions and move through that. And then, um, so technology, hashtags, meeting people. And then Crystal talked about I would call them affinity groups. So she talked about an organization of uh, women in her industry who yeah. she can connect with. That's really important. So just about any demographic category or 
geographic area, anything you can put boundaries around, usually that's a community that will help itself if you approach other members of that community. So that was a great discussion of networking. Thank you, all of you. We're gonna transition now to our next topic. And this one is also very important. And this topic is called, uh, it's promoting and marketing. So the question is, how do we promote and market our entrepreneurial ventures? especially in the early days. Because in the early days, remember, like Crystal was talking about, she started as an individual. That means she doesn't have anyone else with her at that time. And she may have ideas in her head that nobody else in the world has. Even though she's trying to attack a problem that everybody knows about, she has a very unique approach to that problem. And she needs to convey that unique approach out to the world in a way that will get people excited about it so they will want to buy her product and work with her. And so I would like, I'm going to call on one of you here in a moment for this question. Um, we want to know how you get that unique idea out to the world in a way that's attractive to a broad audience. Like what channels do you use and how do you hone your message and make it a strong one to get it out there? And Thomas Walker Jr., we're going to start with you. Yeah, so I appreciate that. The First time that we got the message out to everyone about our business was at a pitch competition. Um, it's a room full of people and they're all eager to hear what kind of business idea or whatever you're trying to do to change the world, right? Um, and that was the first time that we actually uh, put it out, put our baby out there, right? Um, and that was a great opportunity for us because we had to make it exciting, right? And I told you guys that we provide pick up and drop off for car maintenance, right? And these two other panelists have much more exciting businesses and industries than car maintenance, getting your oil changed and that sort. So uh, something that is looked, in, looked at and frowned upon, right? That, oh, I don't wanna do that just, uh, just yet. I wanna go a, a few more hundred miles over for my oil change and that sort. So. Uh, when you do convey or when you do uh, communicate what your product is, you want to touch people uh, where their pain point is, right? Um, wh what bothers them the most about uh, the problem that you're trying to solve with your business and understanding who you are trying to persuade um, your product or your service to. Uh, we've become very, very, very good listeners um, at Swervice and what I mean by that is, is uh, when we try something out, um, whether if it's posting something on Instagram or going to a specific company and uh, offering our business to their benefits department of that sort, if they say yay or nay, if they don't say anything, we try and listen and then go back to our drawing board and say, OK, how can we convey our message differently? Is it a specific demographic that we need to be talking to? Um, it's a very, 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 very um, uh, hard stereotype in the automotive maintenance business uh, that men may know more about cars and that sort, but I'll be sure to tell you that our number one customer is women because they wanna know what's going on with their car. They wanna make sure that they have the right tires on their vehicle. So that's something that we have found just from operating our business in that sort. So who do we market to? Who do we communicate to? Uh, it's busy professional women. Uh, so once you do start going through the, uh, the motions and experiments and marketing and communicating to your customers, ma make sure that you listen to them. Make sure because if you listen to them, they will paint the picture of the different services and where you need to find them. So that's what's very important about communication to your customers. And so, Thomas, you are saying a really effective strategy for marketing and promoting your business is to listen carefully, even listen for longer than you would normally to potential customers. And these are people who may not buy your product when you talk to them, but you'll try to sell them and then they're going to say something to you and you will learn from what they say. And mm -hmm. then you will pitch competitions as well. Right. You will not win. Or you may win, but it, whether you win or lose, you're going to get feedback from the people who are there that you can use to craft and hone and perfect your marketing message. And so I think a lot of the conversation with people who are at pitch competitions 
or potential customers or even potential partners, those conversations themselves can inform your marketing message. But at the same time, you're talking to a lot of people when you do that stuff who may know people who might want to become customers. And so you're just talking about having a conversation in all these different realms as a way to market your business. I yeah. find that very interesting. Yeah. How about you? Uh, so for me, uh, you know, my business is a, is a little different from these guys. Uh, the good thing about our business is, you know, on a weekly basis, we may make anywhere from 40 to 50 cakes. And so the good thing about that is each one of those cakes are going to a different party. So you've got a party for the customer that you've serviced, but you also have 20 to 30 potential customers at each one of those parties. So for me, I always tell my staff, you know, let's make sure that everything is perfected. Let's make sure it tastes good because those are our future customers. Those are our potential customers. They're going to ask that customer, you know, where did I, get, where did you get this cake? Or they'll see our logo or, or a brand or whatever, you know. Um, and then that would be a way for the, for us to get new customers. Another way uh, for us is social media. I mean, social media again. You know, now we live in a world of social media. Uh, so when I first started my colossal milkshakes, which I just added to my business of seven years, three years ago, um, it dramatically changed my business. And it wasn't that I was promoting the milkshakes. It was that each customer that came in took a picture of that shake. They promoted it to their social media and their following. And then we got their, their people got to see what our product was. So it's just that, you know, providing a great product. If you provide a great product each time, you're going to open yourself up to many, many more customers, uh, you know, every chance that you get. So that's why I always check my quality and I'm always actually in my bakery working to make sure that my quality is top notch because I don't know who's going to, you know, see a product of mine or taste a product of mine. That is very interesting. So to, to recap what I got out of that for the audience, um, she is letting her product be a silent partner. In other words, you know, she can talk about her business and communicate about her business, but when that product goes out and winds up at a event or a party, people see that. And I'm sure she has put a lot of thought into designing the product in a way so people know where that product came from. Right. And when they experience it, they share it with others, they talk to others, and that is a kind of marketing channel. And, and so I think that is a genius way to get your message out in a way that we don't always think about it. I, I know we understand branding and advertising and all that, but you're letting the product itself be the marketing message. And that there's a lot of ways to be creative when you do that. And the other thing you mentioned that I want to repeat because it was very interesting is not the product itself, but photos of the product it's can be up on the internet so people can look and you can imagine how that, how fast that can spread. Absolutely. That is very practical advice. All right. So, Funny Mane is, I would say he's a master of social media. So he's going to talk about social media and other things, but we want to know, Funny Mane, how, as an entrepreneur, how to get the message out, how to promote and market your entrepreneurial venture. Uh, with me, my secret is uh, just uh, over-serving uh, the, the people that have came to me. And it's a, it's a football-based market. You know, one of probably the most prominent black businessman out of Birmingham here is A.G. Gaston. And as I read his books, he says, find a need and fill it. Yeah. Uh, so there was a need for football fans to be entertained, not only during the season, but during the off season. So I'm always constantly giving them what they want. And, and then I love to do it too. I love to talk football. Uh, so I, I'll find anything. I'll make anything about football if I can. As you can see from the comments, they, they're doing it too. They want, <laughs> they want to turn it into a pep rally, but that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as like with the online merch and all of that, I you rarely find a picture on the internet of me out, you know, on a public uh, mainstream form without wearing my gear. Like yeah. it, this is promotion. Your logo is your promotion so i'm running the ball everywhere and then uh when they do get these uh shirts or they buy a hoodie or whatever 
these this is also promotion the card that comes in there you probably can't read it there but it's encouraging people to use the hashtag run the ball on their social media so it's like crystal said take a picture of it and put a hashtag so when people search that run the ball hashtag they'll see all of that and then also promoting i want you to come back so yeah 10 percent off the next time you come back so always want to give them a little extra you know in the bag and not only that a little thank you sticker which i mean it which i'll put on every bag um but like when i work with uh my contract with hibbit we'll post up before the alabama football games and i'll take hundreds of pictures like hundreds and everybody's coming up like man do you need water do your cheeks hurt i'm like no i love that these people have chosen to support me so i've learned how to reset and let every individual person have their individual moment with me and that's how it is after my comedy shows too uh, my manager would tell you the lines are long i i don't get tired because i know these people could have been anywhere else so I want to make sure every experience with me is individual for every person. That is fantastic. He said over serving. And so you saw he puts a sticker in the bag. He puts a little card in the bag that has things on both sides of it. One is tied to the mission and the vision. And there's like a culture of football, I think, around a lot of what Funny Main does. But then on the back is a simple promotion, 10% off if you come back. And so these are very clever ways to build promotion, the logic of promotion into the, how you serve the market. So when he, he goes above and beyond, when he overserves, there's, me, there's a message tied to that. But when people receive his product, there's, it's always an opportunity when you connect with the customer to invite them to come back through the mechanism of a promotion like that. That is very practical advice. I think it's often overlooked by entrepreneurs, but if you love what you're doing, you know, someone said earlier, it's like your baby, right? I think it was Thomas who said that. Right, right. You pay every single bit of attention that you can to that baby, your business, and make sure that it's healthy and taken care of and all of that. And that's a labor of love. And I think for the audience out there, if you don't feel that, that love, which by the way, it isn't always happy love. Sometimes it gets on your nerves, but <laughs> it's real and you can feel it. And if you feel that, like these three entrepreneurs clearly can feel about their business, you know you're doing the right kind of thing. Right. All right, we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and we're gonna talk about a topic that I would like to um, tee up a little bit. Um, yeah. In my work with entrepreneurs here, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs who are making money, they're serving customers, they have a brand, they have a logo, they might even have a website, but they have not yet done certain things related to uh, the legal aspects of starting a business, like maybe talking to a lawyer, forming an LLC, yeah. um, you know. So I want to I want to start this discussion by asking a simple question, and that is, when do you three think to the entrepreneurs out there who are listening right now, when should they start thinking about talking to a lawyer who could maybe help them with, you know. You better incorporate, you better form an LLC. Um, you know, at what stage of making money or at what stage of your thought process do you believe it is important for a new entrepreneur who's just getting into the on, their entrepreneurial journey to do that? We want to make it real practical for everybody. I'm going to start with Funny Main. Um, and go ahead and engage that question for me, please. I think when you make your first sale, your first dollar, you should do it, or even before. And because you're not incorporating yourself or getting an LLC for where you are now. You're doing that for the growth uh, for years down the road. And especially now with uh, so many PPE, PPP loans and grants being out there. And I got plenty of friends who've been doing business for years, but they couldn't apply because they did not have the paperwork in and the EINs and all that stuff a lot of that stuff is free to do you can literally get it i think we're frozen here maybe he's gonna come back <laughs> come back to us all right so uh 
he was making a real good point. I hope he knows he's frozen and he's holding that thought. We're going to come back to you, Funny Maine, when you um, come back on here. Crystal? Yeah. Uh, he was about to talk about an EIN, which is okay. free, super easy to do. You can do it at home, online. Uh, you know, create that EIM for yourself. Cause like funny mind said, um, when the pandemic happened and if I didn't have, if I was not able to apply for a PPP loan and the EIDL loan, those could have, I mean, they were the make or break of me staying in business. I was actually closed for two months, fully closed for two months, but had I not had my EIN, had I not, had my LLC and my business license and all the things that I needed to apply for that, I would not have been able to get it. So yeah, it's super easy. You just apply online, get your uh, EIN, and then you take that to your local probate court. If you're in Jefferson County, Shelby County, super easy. I think it's like a hundred dollars or something like that, or it's like a hundred dollars and fifty dollars. Once you get it um, to get the LLC, it's super easy to do. Just do it. Like he said, you know, you need that for the growth of the business. You may not feel like you need it right away because you're like, I'm not making money. Am I going to have this business for a long time? Well, if you don't, you'll still, I mean, it's only $150. You won't, you won't, that won't make or break you, you know. That is such good advice. And I hope everybody out there tuning in takes it to heart and makes a note of what she just said and also what Funny Man just said. You're not really doing it for right now. You're doing it for the future. Mm -hmm. And the future includes things that are unexpected, like a pandemic or like a, an emergency or a crisis situation in which you may need to go and call in some special benefit or um, benefit from a special program or whatever the government might have put in place for you. Mm -hmm. At that point, if you have... The and number and you're properly incorporated, you will be able to get those benefits like Crystal just articulated. So it's not just something that you're doing for right now. You're, it's almost like a, like an insurance policy, if you will, to protect you as you grow your business. And she said, you can Google it. And Funny Main said it was easy. She said it costs a hundred dollars. She talked about Jefferson County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. I would, I would ask everybody to Google and acquaint yourself with this because like I said, I have met a lot of entrepreneurs in the Birmingham region who should have done this already. <laughs> and, um, it's very interesting you all because I, I built my career in the city of Chicago and up there, it was almost the opposite problem. You had people incorporating and doing this when they didn't really need to yet because they hadn't done anything yet. Right. From here, it's kind of like the opposite. And what Crystal said is very good practical advice and like they said earlier if you're if you're still confused or have questions network so talk to other entrepreneurs they will help you and that's free advice it's cheaper than a lawyer you can ask them how they did it and they will help you and so we're still waiting for funny man we'll come back to him i'm sure he's going to appear back here in a little bit but um thomas yeah i want to talk about the same thing um Share your thoughts, share your experience about this really important topic area. So one thing that was that on top of mind for me, um, as Crystal and Jermaine were talking about EINs and LOCs and S Corps and all these different um, weird names, right? Um, so I wanted to share one uh, tool that we used at the at the very beginning stages. We had just made our our, our first valet. Um, so we were like, okay, so we got some money and now what do we do with it? Um, so um, with developing a business structure, um, a tool that we used is a business called Zen Business. Um, it is uh, online. Um, you can go to the website. Again, it's Zen Business. Um, and it was very helpful for us to uh, walk us through what we needed at the time. Um, and um, <clears throat> and that was from when we needed to make an LLC. Um, it walked us through um, registering our name with the uh, state of Alabama. Um, it walked us through as well um, with forming that EIN number. Um, 
but I do encourage you to go and search on Google and resources like that uh, to see what these things are. But uh, Zen Business was a great tool for us uh, that helped us walk through all these different things because again, you don't want to just, um, you're, you're not doing this for the now, uh, you're doing this for uh, the longevity of your business. So uh, Zen Business, um, I, I wanted to just share that, that uh, that was a great tool um, that we used um, developing our, uh, registering our business in that store. All right, Funny Main is back and yeah. we, we uh, teed off what you said, Funny Main, you were talking about growth and you're engaging a lawyer and forming an LLC and getting an employer identification number, not just for right now, but for the future. And then Crystal talked a little bit about future uh, challenges that can emerge and you'll be better prepared to deal with them if you've done that stuff up front. And so please come back and uh, finish your thoughts about the importance of uh, legal formation and talking to lawyers. Anything you can share that's practical that the audience could benefit from, please. I think you're muted. Yeah, I feel like it's better to do it early because dude, if you do it early, you can grow, get all the bumps, bruises out of the way, and then two to three years down the line, you're like, oh, okay, I know what to do. If you want to be two to three years into your business, and then, all right, now I'm going to get a license, and now you got to get the bumps and the bruises, you know, three to four years into the business. So I think it's best to uh, get all of your paperwork in order early, very, very early. Okay. Very wise advice. So we're gonna, we got about 15 minutes left in our discussion. We're gonna segue into a related topic right now for the audience. And it's not legal, but it's kind of related because it's highly practical and it's just as important in many ways, and that is financial. So here we're talking about when you start to make money, when you sell something and you start to make money routinely and regularly and you're selling a product or service under the guise of a, of a name or the entity that is your business, we want to know how do you or how should you or how do you track that money? How should you uh, report it each year? Who do you talk to to make sure that you're reporting it in the right way? We want a real down to earth practical discussion for the early days of these entrepreneurs about tax purposes and reporting of income. How can they start in a way that's accessible for everybody right now to think about and how to get their business off on the right foot. Yeah, so I'll start by saying that it is very, very, very important to track all, all business activities um, and a very practical way um, in the very early days, and we still do it today, um, is using Microsoft Excel. Um, we have columns where we have um, when uh, we travel, um, what the, um, how many miles that we travel um, for different activities, um, when we had to fill up for gas, when we're traveling to go talk to a, a customer, a dealership, uh, when we buy lunch for that dealership, uh, we, we track all of these things. Uh, so um, it's not a surprise at the end, or um, you have all these things going on when you're starting your business. Don't ever think that, oh, well, I'll, uh, I'll put this um, receipt in uh, at, at a later date or or um, I'll remember to do that later. Uh, right then and there, uh, when you use that uh, debit card, when you use that credit card for your business, um, always take down that expense. Um, and we talked about building a good team and knowing the weaknesses and the needs of your of your business as well. And if you feel like you need an accountant um, and somebody to help you out with making sure that um, your finances are in order, hey, don't be afraid to go that route. Uh, but um, I wanted to say, just from a practical standpoint, always track and record your business activities uh, because you don't want that to get away from you at all. You heard what he said, everybody. Um, he said to track all your business activities, and that means on the revenues side and the expenses side. Revenues on the external, right. money coming in, right. expenses on the internal, and that's money that's going away from you. And he's talking about tracking both, and that's right. very important. 
But another thing he said was, if you don't like to do that, he talked about team building and he referred back to our earlier conversation. So a lot of creative types, especially, don't like it because, man, forget that. I'm thinking about what could be and I'm thinking about the idea. So if you're an artist, you better find yourself a business yeah. <laughs> person because yeah. it still needs to be done. Crystal? Yeah, I have an accountant. <laughs> so, uh, you know, she's the one that files all my taxes. She she gets everything in order for me. But also uh, a, a good way is to have a great processing system. So like mm. for me, I have Clover processing and it, it, it tracks everything. It tracks my labor, it tracks, uh, you know, my sales for the day, what what I've done for the month, what I've done for the year, it tracks who's bought this and who's bought that. So, you know, if you have a really good system that allows, it, it shows you, um, you know, what you brought in, what you put out, what's doing really good, what's not, that kind of mm -hmm. helps you. If you're not, if you're like me, I hate the paperwork side of the business. I mm -hmm. absolutely hate it, but it has to be done. You have to track every single expense, like like Thomas said, because if you don't, you will forget. It's so easy. We're so busy and we're pulled in so many different ways all the time. Uh, so for me, like I said, I have an accountant. That makes it the easiest for me. Mm -hmm. So Funny Man was talking about doing this when you make your first sale. He was talking about the legal part of it. So when you start to make money, I have a feeling he's going to say you need to do this right up front in the beginning as well with, with regard to your financials. And then Crystal was talking about getting the right person to do that because she said it can get away from you. And I think Thomas made the same point. So to the audience out there, if you want to start a business and if you want to become an entrepreneur, start having these conversations now. And if you can't afford an accountant, then like Thomas said, there's a team building implication here. You may need a co-founder or a partner or somebody who believes in your vision, yeah. which will communicate to them like Thomas was talking about, but they should also enjoy the account. Maine, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I uh, sympathize with Thomas because I started off with the Excels too after I started <laughs> realizing how important tax information was. I, I did it every day. I would keep all my receipts in one place. And then that at the end of the day, I'd add this. How many shirts do we sell on tour? What do we make from this show? Uh, but now uh, I've learned the power of plastic, meaning I don't do anything cash. It's all I got one card for the business. So that way, all the expenditures are already there. They're lined up. I, they can make their own Excel file. Um, and then I graduated to QuickBooks. So now QuickBooks is like chef kiss. It's, it's the one like you link it to your bank account. Uh, I can uh, at the end of the year, I can just share like one little link from my QuickBook to my accountant. They can see everything that they need to see. They can get all the tax stuff together. Um, so, yeah, there, there are ways to do it, but you got to keep up with every single transaction what what's coming out what's going uh going in you've mm -hmm. got to keep up with every single transaction it makes a difference because when you go out and you try to get a business on they want to know what you've been bringing in how much are you really worth how many assets do you have so it's it's just very important to keep up with those and you do yourself a favor uh by knowing where you're really at you're like, okay, well, we could budget. We usually make about two to five thousand every month, so that's our uh, budget. But keeping up with numbers, very important. That is fantastic advice, and the audience out there, I hope you are taking this to heart. I'm sure there's some entrepreneurs out there who know all this already, but I'm also sure there are some out there who do not. And these three entrepreneurs have just shared some really practical and valuable advice. We have one more topic we're going to cover before we get into the Q&A. And this involves strategic management and competition. So after you launch your business, after you handle the legal and the financial and the, the team aspects of it, which we talked about in our discussion already, you're going to have to compete, which means you're going to have to um, be aware of competitors. It means you're going to have to win customers and you're going to have to do that consistently over time 
And as the environment changes, you got to evolve to stay. It's almost like natural selection. You have to stay fit and uh, so you can compete and perform in the environment. Customers come and go. Competitors come and go. This is the essence of strategy. And we have three entrepreneurs on our panel who are very familiar with this through the truth of their experience. And we're going to get them to weigh in on this topic in the five or so minutes that we have left. And so we will start with Funny Main. And the question is, how do you stay competitive? And as you stay competitive, how do you avoid spending too much money, too much time, getting inefficient? How do you stay lean and mean? Man, uh, somebody who the internet was trying to make a competitor to me actually taught me a great lesson on this. Uh, my man, Scooter McGruder, who some people may be familiar with, uh, he makes college football videos and pro videos on the couch. And when I got popular, everybody was like, oh man this dude is taking your stuff he's trying to be like you they were tagging me and his stuff tagging him and my stuff scooter did the most gangster thing i've ever seen done <laughs> in my life uh he messaged me and said hey let's do a video together he wasn't concerned about the comments or anything he just said man i like your stuff let's do something together that forced the friendship and that paid dividends for both of us because when people saw us together, they stopped talking. It ele his followers now knew who I was. My followers knew who he was. We both are still making content and we're actually friends in real life. So I would say to avoid uh, spending a lot of time and money with competitors, do what T-Mobile and Sprint did, collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> FedEx and Kinko's did it. A lot of people. So you collaborate, you can solve a lot of problems. Yeah, <laughs> that is fascinating. So in other words, you know, the I think the natural knee jerk reaction that an entrepreneur would have when somebody comes up like that is like, man, you know, it's a threat. Right. But right. Tony Main is talking about um, engaging them and just turning that on its head. And because there's usually it's a big enough pie out there for both of you to benefit and learn from one another, even though you're still competitors. Technically, there's a lot of uh, positive, mutually beneficial benefits that can be learned. That's great advice. So those of you out there listening to that, you might try. That's something you could try tomorrow. You could come up on your competitor in a way that surprises them and is beneficial for both of you. We want to keep this conversation going about strategy. So Crystal, please talk about competition, strategic management, and staying yes. uh, competitive. So for me, um, I always add new items. So uh, if I have an idea coming up, or even, even if it's something that's been done, like for example, uh, for Christmas this year, it's hot cocoa bomb, everybody, who's a baker is making hot cocoa bombs. I took that same product and made it different. I made it into a pop. I put a spoon on it. You know, mm -hmm. I take a product or an item and take it to the next level. So for me is to uh, separate yourself from the rest. You know, what is going to make, you know, even though we have this bakery here, this bakery there. And like you said, for me, my, my saying is always, I can't make all the cakes. There's no way. So why should I be threatened by this person who's doing cakes or this person who's doing cakes? I've actually helped two ladies who I met through social media open a business, both of them. They were both at home businesses. I, you know, sat down, met with them, you know, to try to help them get to brick and mortar. And both of them are running super successful businesses. I refer people to them. You know, it's it's not always about a competition thing, but it's a it's about what can you do to separate yourself from the rest. So for me, it's always adding a new item or taking an item and to the next level. You know what I mean? So she's talking about another very important aspect of strategic management, which is differentiation. You know, you're not like getting rid of the product. You're actually tweaking the product, you're evolving it to make it a little bit different from the other ones that are out there. Mm -hmm. that, that is a way to uh, make people need to come to you if they want what you're offering, because no one else is offering it in quite the same way. And that gets down to the heart of innovation and it, it gets into trial and error. And that's important. You got to stay curious. You got to keep trying new things and let that curiosity and that innovation be reflected in your products and services. Thomas, 
what is your recipe for competing in a strategic way? Yeah, so I love this book. It's called Steal Like an Artist. Steal Like an Artist. Um, and what the book talks about is, is that there's a difference between taking something that someone else does and making it better and appreciating them for it. And then there's a difference between just taking something that somebody does and plagiarizing and saying that it's yours. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I continuously practice is looking to see what others in the same field as me and making auto maintenance convenient for other people. See what they're doing. Um, if there is a company, I know the CEO of companies, everything that they do, different uh, services that they try, um, whether it's uh, different um, uh, services or customers that they try to engage with. Um, I, I've watched those things and then um, I try it for myself. Um, and if it works in the in the specific realm of where um, we're trying to go, um, then we put that in our utility belt. Um, mm -hmm. If it's something that does not work, um, then we uh, do like we uh, it, as entrepreneurs, we do, and that is fail fast. Crystal was just saying that she puts out a lot of different products. Um, and um, when you fail fast, what that means is, is that, hey, I'm going to um, experiment something and I'm going to make the hypothesis. If I do this, then this will happen. Mm -hmm. If what you believe or what you say that was going to happen happens, you go from there with it um, and then you expound on that. If it does not work, you move to the next thing. Fail fast, quickly. Um, so um, in the Velocity Accelerator, we learned about doing experiments and we call them sprints. So each week we would have uh, one goal that we would focus on and we would give that hypothesis and say, hey, if I go and talk to 10 lawyers about our service, then we should get three customers. And once we do that and we get two customers, we know where to go from there. Um, or if we get 10 customers uh, from there, then we know that we have something. So uh, always experiment and do it as quickly as possible so that you don't lose time, so you don't lose money um, in doing that and trying to move forward. That is fantastic. So we heard Crystal talk about innovation and rolling out a bunch of differentiated products as they relate to her competitors. We heard Thomas and Funny Main both talk about learning from your competitors. Um, Thomas was talking about like looking at what they do and copying if if you know within the bounds of the law, learning from them, being influenced by them. There's no shame in that. No. Like an artist, like the name of the book that Thomas cited is. And then Funny Main was talking about actually reaching out in a collaborative, coordinated way to a competitor and possibly even doing something together in, in a way that's mutually beneficial. So these are very creative ways to act strategically as an entrepreneur. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the formal discussion. We are now going to open it up for about 15 minutes of Q&A. I think we have some questions coming across in the chat. I've seen them come up. Um, we're just gonna, I'm gonna read them and I'm gonna put them to the panel and we're gonna start this discussion now. And uh, let me see. All right, we got a handful here. I'm just gonna pick one and thank you everybody. By the way, now's the time to post those questions. So get them in if you wanna take advantage of this opportunity. All right, we have specific questions. And we got general questions. I'm gonna start with a real specific one because it came up first. I would like to know more about the process of building out a building I own to operate a commercial kitchen. Any assistance would be appreciated. So I don't know, lessons learned, like who do you talk to? This is kind of a real estate, it sounds like they already own the building, but um, dealing with contractors, any thoughts at all from you all? I know uh, like Crystal especially has physical locations and she may be doing this right now. So I am. <laughs> Crystal, what do you think about that? So the first thing would be uh, is to meet with an architect and choose a contractor. So I've always, I have an architect that I work with on every single project that we've developed a relationship with. Um, and he's gonna be your key to what you can and cannot do. If you get someone that's really experienced, then you know they've you know they've built commercial kitchens already. 
they'll be able to tell you, okay, yes, you, you'll need to have this or you'll need to have that. Because what happens, and a lot of people don't realize that if you go into, just say if I was building a bakery and I say, I want to put this here and I want to put this here, I go ahead and get started. Once the health department comes in, if they have not approved those, you know, that sink to be to be in that place or that stove to be in that area, you will have to redo every single thing. So Mm -hmm. don't start without consulting with an architect, the health department, a contractor, uh, you know, meet with all of those people and uh, see what you need to do first before you make any moves. And so to the audience, we're not going to get down into the particulars like names and whatnot, but you heard what they said, network with other entrepreneurs. So you heard her talk about, and I'm speaking now to the individual who asked this question, Maybe you can uh, find Crystal and ask her and get some references and so forth uh, to really make this happen for you. But that's great advice. All right, we're going to keep it moving. We got a lot of questions coming in here. The next one is, it's specific. It's another specific one. What tips would you give to someone interested in starting a career in auto mechanics and opening their own specialized off-road garage? I think we know who this one is uh, going to. Uh, Go ahead and take it away, Thomas. Okay, so I will make a quick plug and say, if you are looking to start a career, we have three shops that are looking for auto technicians all the time. So, hey, please reach out to me and (laughs) we can help you get that career started for you. Uh, But if you're looking to open your own garage, I believe that that is the first thing that you should do is start your career in an auto shop um, and learn the different specific uh, services uh, that you are most in tune with. Um, And you make a plan. Um, And what that looks like is, is what type of services are you going to do? Um, um, Are you going to do off road? Are you going to do lift kits? Are you going to do engine work? Uh, make that plan of what specific services that you want to provide to your customers. Um, and um, how uh, big do you want the operation to be? Uh, what equipment that you need to uh, purchase? Um, insurance is extremely key. Uh, so there are certain things that you need to put in line um, in your plan uh, before uh, looking to open up your own garage and that sort. Crystal was just talking about real estate and that sort. So um, what particular area uh, of the city or the county or what state do you want to be affiliated in? So uh, there's a different business license um, uh, that you need to uh, 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 to apply for, for um, auto retail and that sort. Um, one great thing I, I would really recommend is, is if you're starting from the ground up and look into franchising, uh, cause many different, um, uh, retailers, uh, Goodyear or Michelin or different distributors, they give you packages, uh, based, based off marketing sales strategy. They'll help you hire people. Um, so that is something turnkey that you can be able to um, uh, to bring into your business um, when you're looking to start um, any kind of auto shop. That's great. I have one more question now. It's a little bit more general. Um, it just flashed off the screen, but I think I remember it. This question said, before you started your business, how did you find out what you wanted to do in life yeah. and what motivated you to put every bit of energy you have into your business? Mm. Maine, go ahead. I think you you're on mute, Maine. That's a tough question. And uh, I have to remember that that is a, a, a tough thing for people finding their passion uh, for something. I have to remember my early 20s, I had no idea uh, what I wanted to do. And I, I, I just... I, I felt led toward comedy. I think if you're a spiritual person, the obvious answer is to pray for pray to God for guidance. Um, if you're not a spiritual person, you you know earthly, you got different ways of moving around. Try different things out. You know, mm-hmm. try try out different things, but try out stuff that I would suggest trying out stuff that you're naturally good at. 
I'm naturally good at sitting on the couch watching football. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it really is. So, um, and then social media is a game changer. So no idea is a bad idea. You know, there was a time where uh, the networks told you what talent you were, or they gave you the, the options that you have for the talent that you were going to support. But with social media, people choose you. So you could, you could put out, 50 different videos about 50 different things and then million people might like that 49 video so i would just say try stuff out and alex you look like you're young enough you still got time so <laughs> trying stuff out man that's what i would say very good very good we have a few more questions we're going to try to get through them all everybody another very specific one where do i go for covid relief funding i think crystal mentioned ppp loan or something anybody anything you guys can share for the audience about this question um i can share with that so for me uh i'm just lucky to bank with you know with a really small bank where my bank came to me and told me laid everything out crystal this is what you're gonna have to do to receive uh you know this funding also there's a program in birmingham i don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, um, there's a lady named Torin. She runs a group called Ignite Alabama. And mm -hmm. what I love about them is uh, they always send out emails or texts and they always tell you, hey, you know, this grant is up for grabs or, you know, go here to this link to apply. So, you know, reach out to different links or people who are in the city who know about the you know, PPP loan or the EIDL loan. But like I said, I was just lucky that, uh, you know, my bank is a really small bank and I have a great relationship with them. So they actually gave me all the information that I needed to receive the COVID relief. That is excellent practical advice to everybody out there. If you have a question about COVID relief funding, you probably have a checking account. You probably have a bank. If they didn't come to you like Crystal's bank did, go in there and right. ask them they yeah. will probably be able to point you in the right direction. Yeah. Jen Jen's talking about local government can help with startups and um, absolutely, that's right. So it, it's down to networking, it's down to talking to other entrepreneurs like we talked about a little bit earlier, but the funding is out there and if you don't know exactly where to go to get it, do some of the things that we just talked about. We are getting close to the end of our time. I am gonna ask a question of our panel and um, it should be a pretty easy question for them, but it's an important one we haven't touched on yet. So I want to make sure to get it out there as you guys encounter success, you know, and we talked about people approaching you to network and all of that. Sometimes people will approach you and you will need to say no as an entrepreneur when you're coming up. And it's hard to say no because you want to make everyone happy. You want to serve all customers. I really want, if you can, if you have a personal philosophy about how to know when to say no or how to how to say no without saying no itself. You know, you want to be polite and not reject people. This is important for entrepreneurs because if you say yes to everything, it, you're going to wind up in a dark place probably. So I, I'm just going to go through all three of you and I ask you to please engage this. And Crystal, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, for me, you know, I have things that I will do and things that I won't. So you know, get a plan, have a plan of, you know, things that you want to participate in. Like for me, I like to help, you know, if someone comes to me with something for kids or for women or, you know, something that generates to me, especially if it's something extra on top of what I already have to do, um, you know, I'll typically generate to those things. You know, is it going to be beneficial to me, but am I going to be able to actually benefit the person? You know, mm. uh, and if not, if I can't, if I don't feel like I'll be able to help you in that area, then I'm probably going to say, well, no, I can't, you know, I can't help you in here, but I will lead you to where you can get the help, you know. Very, very good advice. Thomas Walker Jr. Yeah. Um, saying no is a very powerful tool. Um, I think that when you know when you need to say no is that you, you know your value um, and you know um, how valuable your time is. Uh, one practical thing that you can do, and I'm doing it with one of um, our business advisors right now, and that is making a plan for the year upcoming. What does that look like for the next three months, 
five months, six months, um, and, and so forth. Um, and if things come to you, uh, different ideas, or if somebody says, hey, try this idea, you, you should get more customers or you should scale quickly, um, see if that's within that scope of your priorities first. Um, and if it's not, you can kindly say no. Hey, that, that sounds like a great idea uh, and we should try that at some other time. Um, and then also just probing people that may come to you, like Crystal was just saying, uh, they may come to you for a specific problem or if they say, hey, I want to have coffee with you. Uh, ask questions like, um, and it's okay to, to ask, what is it that you want to talk about? Um, and if it's something that you can help them with, you know, find that time. Um, but if it's something that you can't, you kindly say no and then point them in the right direction. Um, so knowing the value of your time and also your priorities is very important. I really like that he used the word value. And when I hear the word value, I think about values, which makes me think of culture and purpose. Yeah. We all know what we stand for. We know where we came from, being our community or our ethics or whatever it is. And if you get down to that level, the level of your values, you have a sense of right and wrong and what you will do and what you won't do. And so being created by your culture, your values in that way is instrumental to saying no. Excellent, Thomas. Funny man, please, how do we say no? Let's get to the root of why people don't want to say no. Uh, and I take this in. If y'all don't remember nothing else I say tonight, remember this. You're not a bad person for telling somebody no. You've done a lot of good in your life. You've given to a lot of people. You're awesome. You pray. You tithe. You're a good person, okay? It's okay to say no uh, because you can't do everything for everybody. Uh, but what I've learned to do uh, when people ask me for stuff, um let's say they ask me for advice or money i give them a book recommendation <laughs> i say you know uh this is i read something good about what you're asking about man you should read this book right here so i gave you something but you gotta go put in a little work too i do it all the time i'm like yeah check out this book or check out this book. and i'm not being a you know a, a smart aleck or anything like that i genuinely mean it but you know, a lot of times people just come up to you and uh, ask for money or they ask for endorsements. Endorsements are money. You know, you can't just endorse everybody on your page that, you know, people pay millions of dollars for endorsements on the Super Bowl. So endorsements are money. Um, but when I met uh, Kevin Hart, when I met Steve Harvey, uh, when I met all of these different people that I love in my industry, I always ask them what book are you reading? What are you watching? What are you listening to? And once I did that, it was a different conversation because they get people all day asking for money and different things. So I just decided to take that other route. And yes, I will quickly give you a book recommendation, but it's going to help you in the long run. Just trust me. That is probably the best way to say no that I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> Let me recommend a book to you. That is great. And so this, we just talked about saying no, but I think everybody in this conversation and in the audience um, is thinking in terms of yes and affirmation right now about entrepreneurship, about the future, about our communities, and about the, the power that you can actually invoke and the ability to succeed that you can make yours if you connect with others in the way that this distinguished panel has connected with everybody tonight. This conversation has been amazing. Um, before I sign us off and do a rundown of who's on the panel again, um, I want to ask, are there any final thoughts about what you're working on right now? Quickly, quickly now, what you're working on or what you'd like to get in there before we finish up our conversation? Uh, Crystal, we'll start with you. Okay, so I'm working on a couple of things. Um, I'm actually acquiring my first building. So this will be my first building that I actually own and operate. Super excited about that. Um, and then I'm also opening another store in Birmingham that'll be down in Uptown, opening this June 2021, Lord willing, right next door to June's Hot Chicken. So I'm excited to come back to my hometown I moved to Alabaster about 10 years ago, and this is kind of how my business resided here. 
but I've always wanted to bring my business back to Birmingham. So I'm super excited about that. Uh, just, you know, follow us on social media, uh, you know, keep up with us that way and find Pinky around Birmingham. That's my food truck. <laughs> That's that <pretty> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And uh, Thomas Walker Jr. Yeah. So, um, I've, I've really enjoyed this, y'all. Um, and where Swervis is going right now, we're moving at great speeds. Um, this this year has caused us to pivot a couple of times, um, and we're in, going in a direction right now that's going to help us really scale our business. Um, we found a, um, a, a customer uh, that is going to help us very strategically position ourselves to uh, move forward um, and um, that's always great to hear. Uh, great to see. We have new markets that we're going to be uh, popping up in in 2021. Um, so that's great to see as well. Um, and just some parting thoughts that I just want to leave for uh, those of you that are looking to start your business. Uh, be OK and comfortable where you are at right now. Um, Good. Take affordable steps uh, to move forward. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. Chipped wasn't built in a day, a year. Fleetio wasn't built in Amazon. You know, Amazon, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> uh, take these significant steps uh, to gaining knowledge. Read a book, like Funny Man said. Um, ask for help from different entrepreneurs and where you need to go. Uh, certain uh, foothills that they had to climb um, and and really tack on that traction uh, to help propel your business. Uh, so those are some things that I just want to leave you with. Be OK with yourself or where you are at right now and be comfortable where you are um, and just keep going. Thank you, Thomas. And Funny Mane, any parting thoughts? And please update us on what you're working on right now and what you're excited about right now. Oh, th uh, this was uh, excellent. Um, right now, this event and other events is all a part of me keeping a promise. Uh, over the summer, uh, the city of Birmingham really supported me uh, when we went to the park and just rearranged some furniture, no big deal. Uh, but they supported me and I told them that, uh, that I, you know, it was going to be a hundred percent more positivity moving forward and doing things for them. And so we had the uh, uh, more than a March event. Uh, we created a group from that. I created community service Saturdays where every Saturday on social media, I'm out uh, cleaning with the communities or uh, giving away toys or giving away coats. Uh, we've done work with Be A Blessing Birmingham, helping to uh, feed and clothe the homeless. And now this uh, giving back and helping young business entrepreneurs. So. It's just going to be more of this. I really care about my city, Birmingham. So uh, we're just going to keep making it a better place uh, economically, uh, socially, and just so many different ways. It's, you know, it's a lot of work to do, man. I mean, there's a lot going on in Birmingham, unfortunately, with the schools and the violence and um, just, you know, people not having the means to take care of themselves and then you throw brother COVID in the mix and it gets even worse. Uh, but I had an epiphany uh, a few weeks ago as I was sitting around thinking about all this stuff that's going on in my city and in my state. And I say, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It seems like a lot. It seems overwhelming, but I realized that it's just right for God. So I'm a spiritual person and I believe that God is working through us to have great events like this and have so many people tuning in and that's what we're going to keep. We're going to keep pumping it out, man. So uh, follow Community Service Saturday, uh, the hashtag on Instagram and Facebook. And also, Doc, uh, I, don't, I don't know who's um, uh, on this new app, Clubhouse. But if y'all want to join over there, I got funny name, the handle over there. But we can talk about this stuff some more uh, maybe tomorrow. Dr. Murphy, I'd love to get you on there. I know you're probably not up on the app. It's, it's growing, but uh, I will be though. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get you on there, and then uh, we'll get some people uh, behind you, so we could just talk like this for a while. We could take a few more questions and everything. But this was uh, this was awesome. Glad to see yeah. you. Uh, uh, glad to be introduced to you, Doctor Murphy. You just a wealth of knowledge. They haven't seen a tenth of what you really <laughs> know and what you could really do. 
Uh, my man Thomas been knowing him since he was a freshman down in Alabama. He same height, but he's grown <laughs> and for sure. And uh, and Crystal, we grew up in the same neighborhood in Pratt City. So uh, this is just amazing to see it come full circle, man. I really enjoyed it tonight. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I think that's very inspiring. And um, all entrepreneurship starts with problems, but we like to think of problems as if they're questions, not exactly problems, but more like questions. Right. Problems call for solutions, questions call for answers. A lot of entrepreneurship starts there and it improves communities and uh, events like this and what's happening in the broader city that Funny Main just talked about is the kind of water that's rising that'll float all boats. And that's what we're all aiming for. I wanna give a special thank you to our panelists, uh, Crystal Bryant, owner and chef at K&J's Elegant Pastries, Thomas Walker Jr., co-founder and CEO of Swervis, and Funny Main, CEO of Main Attractions M&P. My name is Dr. Patrick J. Murphy. I'm the Goodrich Endowed Chair and Professor and Director of the Entrepreneurship Program at UAB. We are building an entrepreneurship program that is going to be the best in the country. We're gonna be a magnet in the Southeast and we're gonna do it by serving our community, thinking globally, but acting locally. It's been a pleasure to moderate this discussion and I would ask everyone in the audience to follow these entrepreneurs and connect with them, connect with the UAB Entrepreneurship Program and watch for more events like this for the good of our community. So everybody have a wonderful night, be safe and be well and happy holidays. Thank you guys. Thanks. Happy holidays.